Hi, everybody. Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Digital Leadership Associates. Really excited today. I've got Tiffany Bova all the way from the US online. Uh, Tiffany and I are going to talk about her new book, which is uh, called Growth IQ. Um, and you've actually got a copy there, haven't you, uh, Tiffany? Because it's, it's very exciting. Oh, it, even the, the, the print um, still drying. Still, uh, the print is still drying. I have to yeah. wear gloves. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, Tiffany, so before we start, I always ask the question, where can people find you on um, um, on social media? So I'm at Tiffany and it's T-I-F-F-A-N-I underscore Bova at Twitter. And then same thing at LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as Pinterest. Uh, and then I have my own podcast called What's Next with Tiffany Bova. So, you know, I'm I'm pretty active out there in the social sphere. You are pretty active, yes. But in case there was one or two people that didn't know, um, and 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 the spellings are always um, uh, difficult because people often yeah, the jewelry store messes it up for me. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. They didn't ask, so. <laughs> so 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 Tiffany, what you know? What's your story? You know, you worked at some amazing companies like Gartner and Salesforce. Um, and um, what what is it that that's that, that gets you where you are today? I'd say it's absolutely a passion for the art of selling and the art of growth, really. At the end of the day, I, I call myself a recovering seller. I kind of joke that I bleed sales blood still today, even though I don't carry a quota in the way that I always have uh, historically in the past. But every day I'm out here kind of fighting the fight to make sure uh, that companies are empowered and enabled to be successful in growing their top line business. Cool. And and so... Is that what gave you the, the 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 view to actually write your your growth IQ book? I thought it was a combination of things. I think it's it's a combination of being an, a practitioner seller, right? So running, being a quota carrying individual sales rep, and then kind of being a lead, and then being a manager, and then kind of being a director, and then moving up the food chain, uh, eventually making it to a VP in a Fortune 500 company, running a a division of Gateway Computers, uh, which is sort of on the PC side of, of oh, the yeah. world, if you will. Uh, and, and so I was very much a practitioner, and I was super early in the cloud. Uh, I was one of a, a Loqua's beta clients back in 2000, Constant Contacts beta clients. So I was doing recurring revenue sales forces and sales teams at the time, socially selling. It wasn't called all those things then, uh, but I was very early from 99 to about 2000 and, uh, 2004. Uh, and, and, and then um, it was a matter of now I wanted to kind of become a academic studying back in to say, you know, what are the best practices of big sales organizations and small and what makes companies more successful than others? And that was really my tenure at Gartner, which was which was a decade. And I left as a research fellow, which uh, was really an honor to be uh, in that category of the analysts. And then I thought, you know, I want to get my hands dirty again and get closer to the customers, because sometimes customers will only let you get so close when you work when you work at Gartner. Uh, so I wanted to get closer to the action of actually some of the things we were saying from a prediction standpoint to see them coming to fruition and watching how people were dealing with a lot of the things that Gartner and myself had been saying over time. And then it led me here to Salesforce and they created a position for me that I obviously I couldn't pass up. <laughs> so uh, here I am. And so I think that's the that's the journey of the book as well. It's kind of this combination of my own experience watching from afar, looking for patterns in behavior, and then writing a book I wanted to read. So, uh, and it's interesting because um, the, the book, um, certainly to me, it, it's, it positions itself very much as um, if you're into growth and you're into certainly into digital, this is the thing that you need to, you need to actually read because the, the problem with digital transformation and and the world today is actually nobody knows what they should be doing because we've not been through this time before um and um there's not a lot of people with that um uh with that skills and you actually come up with 10 paths to growth don't you you actually say these are the 10 things that you need to look at for growth yeah and I, i'd say this and, and you really nailed it when you just said that that this is the first time we've experienced uh, this kind of connection or nexus of multiple things happening simultaneously. I mean, we've had, this is the fourth industrial revolution. So we've had three revolutions beforehand, right? Where things have drastically changed. This is the fourth, 
But really, when you talk about kind of social, mobile, cloud information, access, smartphones, you know, all, you know, cost of bandwidth, access to internet uh, connectivity and Wi-Fi all coming together simultaneously. That's what makes it really interesting from a growth perspective. But one thing you said is it's we don't respond, yet many people actually try to respond with the same things they've always used in the past historically. And they're very confused as to why it's not as effective today as it might have been five years ago or 10 years ago, because it always worked. And so that was kind of the big the big starting point or the jumping point uh, around the book is what got us here isn't going to get us there, uh, where people have said, oh, we're going to just dial the dial, spend more marketing money, hire more salespeople, launch into new markets. <laughs> enter new, you know, new categories. It's like the same dials we've always turned and the people are going, wow, we're getting these diminished returns on our marketing spend. Adding another head isn't giving us the same return. Launching new products isn't giving us the same return. So why not? And that that was really uh, uh, what brought me to the 10 paths. So, I mean, I, I, I saw an, an article recently on LinkedIn, which said, um, all of it, you know, it's getting really difficult, but the answer is very simple. We just have to work harder. And pedal faster and make more calls and, and it's like ah, okay uh, the, you know there's there's actually ways that you can work smarter now what, what where is it what how do you see or what, why is achieving growth getting harder i think it's getting harder now because number one the customer is far more demanding than they've ever been historically where it used to be from a seller's perspective, we we were responsible for educating the customer about what it is we did, what we sold, how it worked, how much it was, who our customers were, our references, you know, those kinds of things. And now that has almost been eliminated where the customer is able to do many of those things, if not all of those things, all on their own. So I believe the customer is actually far more disruptive than technology could ever be, which has sales on its back foot. Right. Instead of lean, you know, us being very aggressive moving forward, it has sales a little bit on its back foot going, OK, we have to be now responsive and reactive and proactive versus, you know, uh, being uh, or predictive, being more predictive than being reactive. It you know, used to be the phone rang or an email came in. We responded, you know, top of the funnel ad comes in and drives us leads. We respond. And now that's just not good enough. So. Uh, I think the customer is making growth harder. That's one. Two, I think kind of the flattening of capabilities where companies can literally disrupt huge industry and, in, you know, incumbents with something like an Uber or an Amazon or yeah. whatever it might be. You, you right. Talk about and, Kylie Jenner, you know, who. Right. I was just going to say, I mean, Kylie Jenner is a great example. If you look at her employee per revenue, she has like less than 20 employees, literally. And six hundred and fifty million dollars estimated in revenue. Well, I don't know anybody else that has, you know, that kind of revenue per employee, uh, and completely unique and new ways of using social and using a platform. Yes, her celebrity helped, no question. Uh, and regardless of whatever you think of the Kardashian family, it doesn't really matter if you can pull that, you know, separate that from this example. All of a sudden, you start to see how do you use social in ways. Uh, that can really garner this raving fan sort of mentality of people wanting your products. Uh, and she's honed into who, who her fan base is and what they want from her. Uh, so what can you learn? What lessons can you learn from that example? Uh, you know, and the interesting I, I think it's really interesting. The, yeah. I mean, I find Kylie Jenner really interesting and I know people will huff and puff and say, you know, you know, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that most people I talk to think that they're cleverer than Kylie Jenner. And and um, whether that's right or wrong doesn't matter. But she also has you and I have all the tools that Kylie and Jenna have on social and they're free. So, yes, so, we just don't have, you know, 150 million followers. We, but yes, we don't. But we actually have all the tools that she has. And yes. and and a number of people say to huff and puff and say, yeah, but, you know, who is Kylie Jenna? Yeah, but she's, you know, and and and, and she, 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 you know, it's just like anybody. You know, you 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 now have your barrier to entry to market now is zero. You can start up a company, you can spin it up, you can um, uh, scale and be a global business, and have no money, um, and no employees, and no employees, 
and that for a G, um, uh, uh, um, you know, look at you. You talk about Netflix um, and Amazon and Red Bull, which are all organisations that have actually taken on um, the establishment and won. Yeah, and I would I would say this. I'd say you know there have been other celebrities that have launched products and not been successful, right? So celebrity is one part of it. The you know free access to a massive social media following, which she has, which obviously comes from the fact of the show and and the family and all of those things. But it's how you're able to pull those things together and use it. Uh, one of the key concepts in the book is. You know, what's the context of the market? So she saw an unmet need, and so she wanted to go after it. Very similar to another example in the in the book, The Honest Company, where there wasn't you know sustainable or non toxic uh, diapers for uh, Jessica Alba's new daughter. And so you know I find a need in the market, and then I go and fulfill it. What's the best way to do it? And so it was I found a need. Then do I want to build the capabilities myself? Well, today partnering, which is another path in the book, is a great way to establish that. So she partnered with a manufacturer and got all the products, you know, manufactured and tested and FDA approved and all of those things and on both cases. right? And so I'm going to partner to deliver that instead of creating my own R&D facility, which, of course, historical companies, you know, 20th century companies, that's their way to market, right? Where 21st century companies are like, mm, you know, do I just partner uh, to do it? So, uh, you know, that that then coupled with how do I maximize a platform and deliver, you know, good enough products at a fair price with a premium because of my brand and then a little bit of scarcity on, you know, there's only a limited number allows you to keep pushing through the market. So very classic marketing tactics uh, were used in that case, as well as many others in the book. But I think that people negate her right out of the gate because of uh, everything that flies around that name. Mm. So you talk about those 10 paths to growth. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I needed something to be digestible, right? I think that people will go, well, there's a hundred ways to grow or a thousand ways to grow. And I think that's overwhelming. You know, having been kind of consulting companies over a decade in my previous role, it was always, you know, we don't even, we don't even know where to begin. Mm. And so that's why I tried to back up and go, well, let's start at the beginning. What's the context of the market? Who's the customer? What are you trying to accomplish? And once we have that baseline, then it's, what are you doing now? What's working? What's not working? And then versus just looking at your competitors, it's what other industry, what other company is doing something you think is unique and is adding tremendous value. And so I was able to sort of boil it down to 10 unique paths. And people might say, there's no way there's 10. What about this? And, you know, if I if I really, you know, move it around, I can almost get anybody's growth idea into one of those 10. Yes, one of them, you know, the, it might be a stretch, but ultimately the goal was to just get everything to fit in those 10. But I didn't want to recreate the wheel because I don't think it needed to be recreated. I think there were things that have been in market and used for a very long time uh, and they just needed to be modernized based on everything that you just said, right? That we have available to us in the 21st century. Uh, how do we modernize those growth paths that have been, or levers that have been used in the past? And then I added ones that now are starting to really come to fruition, like customer experience or doing well by doing good, right? So sort of per, you know, purpose over profit and trying to do things that are much more socially conscious for growth. So I tried to lean into some things that we're now seeing as, as new ways in which companies are trying to separate themselves and differentiate in the pack. Yeah, because you've got things like customer experience, um, yep. uh, customer base penetration. You know, it's a classic thing that we forget to do, which is we so busy trying to sell new stuff that we forget about existing customers. Um, you talked about uh, uh, partnerships, cooperation, uh, unconventional strategies. I mean, and and I, I I think well, I mean I went through them, you know, preparing for this call, and I think you do pretty much boil them down into you know things like churn and stuff, where you know some organisations will get more churn than others because it's the nature of their market, like right. or something like that. Um, so, but the next thing that you talk about is context, um, yes. and you 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 come up with a um, you come up with a, a very nice um uh formally in terms of context plus combination plus sequence but what do you mean by context so i literally mean that oh, let's just pick netflix as an example 
you know, if Netflix had come out or tried to come out or go head to head against Blockbuster before households had a inexpensive DVD player, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. If they had gone to streaming before bandwidth had come to a majority of the homes in the United States, it wouldn't have worked. Yep. So context is, you know, you can't just launch a product and say, you know, I'm going to mail DVD DVDs out and that's how we're going to disrupt, you know, Blockbuster because at the time, uh, Blockbuster was still tapes as well. Mm. So you and, had and moving five Blockbuster stores in Alaska or something. No. Yeah, and I think one one of them just closed a couple yeah. weeks ago, but there's still uh, actually a tremendous amount of customers, uh, my mother included, who still gets uh, uh, movies by mail and does not stream. So it's still a very profitable piece of their business. But had Netflix done any of those things prior to the market context actually being appropriate for them, they would have gotten way too ahead of their skis on it, right? It would have been uh, the right idea at the wrong time. So context has everything to do with you know, so the the example of the honest company, if the temperature of the market was not that mothers or new families of newborns were not being more sensitive to the things that their babies were ingesting or putting on their skin, that we were becoming more conscious of all the toxins, people would have been like, like, who wants to spend an extra two or three dollars for what? Like, it's not going to make my baby rash or, you know, it's better for the environment. I mean, imagine that 25 years ago, people would... No. So context really has to do with, uh, you know, what's going on in the market and does it support what you're trying to do? So how do we second is, con oh, go ahead. I was going to say, go how ahead. do we get the right growth strategy in the right sequence? Because actually these 10 paths, you, you know, we can do one and we, we, we win and then we can do another one and we can swap it around. It's not a book that you then take and, and put on a shelf. It's kind of like there all the time, isn't it? It is. And, and the, the one aha for me was less about the 10 paths. While I thought that was obviously very interesting in a way to, to your point that I needed to boil it down to something that was digestible. Um, but the aha for me in my learnings over the last 20 years has been, it isn't the one thing, it's the combination of many things. And so when I say combination, so as an example, you know, uh, McDonald's is in the, is in the book as well. And they launched an all day breakfast menu. And the customer set had been saying, I want all day breakfast. Mm. And it wasn't, it wasn't something new to McDonald's. They've been hearing it for a long time, but they were adding things to the menu and go back to context. People wanted healthier food. Mm. So McDonald's started launching healthier menu items, right? So context was shifting, but instead of taking things off the menu, they just kept adding, adding, adding. And so all of a sudden they had 150 things on the menu. And then the, you know, the drive through line was too long and the lines inside and it was no longer kind of fast food customer experience was being impacted. So then they said, Let, let's take a beat and figure out how we can get back on a growth path. Let's go with all day breakfast. Had they just said Monday morning, every McDonald's around the world is just going to serve breakfast all day. It would have failed miserably because the kitchens could not have accommodated all day breakfast because the grills couldn't cook meat and eggs at the same time. So they actually needed to operationally fix the kitchen, rearrange it, add another grill. They needed to reduce menu items. They needed to train staff and they needed to rearrange some other things, uh, you know, from, from their supply chain. Mm -hmm. Had they not done those things. So that's kind of the combination and sequence mm -hmm. playing into that. Right. So the growth path would have been right. You know, let me introduce a product, but if the combo and sequence happened to have been off in that example, uh, it, it would have been the right idea. Uh, that would have fallen under the weight of the fact that the the infrastructure could not have handled it. And you talk about there being, in terms of your growth plan, you need to talk about the economic climate, the product mix, the competitive landscape, and the customer base, which you have there. Yeah, absolutely. And and then and so, you know, when when you think about combination. Uh, there's, there used to be, uh, never a time when I would go to meet with a customer and they'd go like, God, we need growth. You know, we're looking for sales. Mm. And then I'd give them some answers and they'd be like, no, 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 no. We need it like in quarter, like right now. And like the problem is there's very little you can do to move that dial fast enough, unless it's just, just pour more marketing dollars into it, which then means, are you getting the right kinds of customers, et cetera. But thinking about, uh, growth as, something that is building blocks back to your point. It's not a book you just put on the shelf as the context of the market changes. 
should you be focusing on another growth path because of that? Or should you be adding another growth path to the one that you have? So it's not just about combining. It could be jumping from one to the other because the context has changed uh, or the market landscape or a new competitor or, you know, whatever new regulation. Something happened that makes it more difficult for you to achieve growth the way that you've been growing. So it's not all about speed, you're saying? So, you know, I love the speed is the new currency. You know, I love that statement. However, uh, faster is not always better. And I think that's that trap of we've always grown this way. So let me just spend more marketing dollars because I need growth in this quarter. You know, and churn's another one. You can't fix churn. Really tough to fix churn in quarter if you've got some systemic problem that's going on that's making customers leave. Uh, so if you're not working on that all the time, then then you're in trouble. So uh, I think speed is important. I'm a big fan of making sure that you are just slightly ahead of where your customers are going to be kind of a quarter or two out. So you meet them there when they show up. Right. Does everybody need to be Steve Jobs? Does everybody need to be Jeff Bezos? Does everybody need to be Elon Musk or Mark Benioff? I'm not saying you need to know what people are going to want five or 10 years from now, but you better know what your customers want at least 12 months out from now and make sure that when they get there, you're welcoming them. So that to me is enough speed for the average company where the more aggressive disruptors are really pushing the envelope on speed. And and why is choosing the path to growth so challenging, do you think? Uh, I think it's the mindset of what got us here is going to get us there. And so they keep trying to optimize what they've always done. Uh, and that's nobody's fault. I mean, I think change is hard. Mm. And so really trying to step back and look at the market and, and analyzing the context what are the what's the competitive landscape? What has changed? What technologies have changed? Um, what do our customers want? So if you don't know who your customers are, you can't know what they want. Um, where are more like them? Whatever the question might be, and then say, is what we're doing now from a growth perspective at the top line still working as effectively, or is it harder for us to get people to come in the door doing the same things? And then let's start testing some other ways in which we can drive it. But I think the big issue here is just absolutely being comfortable with what we're doing today. And uh, it's, hard, it's hard to make those you know, different decisions. And, and how do you know which is the right growth path for your company? Uh, that's a great question because you know, when I wrote the book, everyone's like, you need to just say, what's the best growth path? And I'm like, oh, that's sick. it's impossible for me to do because everyone's context is different. Mm -hmm. If I were to say, this is the way to grow, like this is the way to grow. Then what I basically just said is context combination and sequence don't matter because mm -hmm. then everybody should grow this way. So I will say, here are 10 we can pick from. I'm going to guess just based on you know, if you're a recurring revenue business, I'm going to say we probably should focus on churn <laughs> because we know we can get some lift there. If you have a large sales force, you know, more than a person, if you have a large sales force, kind of more than 10 or 15, probably, we probably could get some more productivity out of that group. So we want to optimize sales, which is another path. You, we may say, you know what, the, the journey that our customers have to go on to buy from us is terrible. It's, you know, fraught with too many steps, too many clicks, too many problems. So once again, optimize, but we should probably focus on customer experience. I mean, I can make general assumptions regardless, just based on what industry uh, somebody's in, but I don't think there's any one way uh, to grow, uh, uh, to grow a business. And, and that's what's the beauty of, of commerce today, yes. you know, and competition today. I mean, it's just, it's an open field. Uh, where a small little disruptor can become a unicorn and a billion dollar player disrupting a hundred year old company, you know, in a matter of 24 or 36 months. Mm, absolutely. And, I, and and for me, that's what's exciting about today is the fact that, absolutely. you know, that, um, you know, the, you know, who, you know, Shazam's and uh, the Facebook's and uh, Tesla's and uh, the Netflix's and, and how they can appear. And, and you suddenly go, how did I ever, um, live without Shazam or, um, or yeah. you know. It's well, I, I use Tesla a lot. I didn't actually use Tesla in the book mm. as an example outside of a brief mention. It was not one of the case studies I did. But I, I like to use Tesla because as salespeople, they're like, oh, 
you know, you can sell transactional things online via commerce and, but you know, the more expensive projects or, you know, ticket item, dollar ticket items, you're going to need a human. And so I say, I, I might agree with you, except I think Tesla has proven that sight unseen, never driven, still in like a clay model form, Tesla was able to sell online via a credit card, a $130,000 US car <laughs> and sell out in hours with a thousand, per, you know, multiple thousand person waiting list. So, and, and I okay, think, maybe. And I think the BMW 7 Series, I think, you know, which is a, um, that must be for, in dollars, must be like 120, 30, $150,000. I think certainly in the UK, they're bought, um, and 80% of the people don't test drive it. Yes. Because it's a BMW 7 Series, it's going to be perfect, isn't it? Yeah, or they already have one. Yeah. And so they're getting the latest version of it, right? In the Tesla case, it was literally, I've never driven one. I may have not even ever been in one, right? Because people didn't have access to them initially. Uh, and even when you go to the retail store, the car dealership store for Tesla, those people that are in the dealership, you know, they're in a mall, not in a car lot, you know, they're in a mall and those people don't sell. They're not salespeople. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I think that that gives a great example. Uh, even if you look at commerce now with uh, Bonobus, right, that you can walk in, you could try things on, you know what size you are, but you don't leave with merchandise. And you're able to commerce right there. And then everything ships to your house the next day or same day in some cases. And so it's shown that people want to actually engage with a human, but they don't have to necessarily walk out with the with the goods and services right at that moment. Uh, and so what does that change for the reason why retail is getting so hammered is it's 50,000 square feet of everything you could possibly want to buy in one place. And customers are like, you know, I don't need all that, right? I can I get, like it. Buy I can all get it online. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, big box retail, certainly in the UK, is, is a dying, um, is, a, is a dying industry because all, all they've ever done is take big, big screen TV, put 10% on it and put it in a warehouse and I can buy it online for 10% cheaper. I have it shipped to my house. Yeah. And I think, so then that's the, that's the customer experience play. What's going to make them not just walk into the retailer showroom, right? So I'm going to shop and then leave and buy online. You know, so you don't want your retail establishment to just be a showrooming place where everybody gets to try all the products and then leave. So I think we're a little over square footed, but I think it also means that retail in specifically needs to go to this kind of experiential retail. And so what can they do within that square footage to make it more engaging, more customer friendly, you know, empower the sales associates to be more informed and digital and empowered, you know, where now I walk into a retailer, you know, I'm there, it pops up a promo to my smartphone because I use the app, I can order and pick up. And it's this omni-channel retail experience where I'm both in the physical store, but I'm shopping online, potentially between back and forth between um, mediums, if you will. And, and right now it's like, nope, I'm just going to ship X product, add 10% and people are going to still want to buy from me. Mm. And we all know what's been going on in the, in the U S and, and in, in places in the UK, but then you have European Sephora. Yes. Doing amazing things. I mean, growing exponentially. One of the case studies in my book completely pivoted onto customer experience. They're just bringing other people's products in adding a percentage, but why are they growing so quickly? Because they've tied it to online virtual reality, customer experience, loyalty. They've started to create their own brand. Uh, it's this wonderful example of successful retail, no question. So, so um, if you're a business leader um, and you're unsure about what you need to do, first thing you've got to do is obviously read your book. After they've read their, <laughs> after they've read your book, uh, Tiffany. Um, what steps do business leaders need to take? So at the end of each chapter, what I tried to do was kind of do a, what's your key takeaways? What are the things you should take out of this? And the thought was really to sit down with your team on Monday morning or your next staff meeting and go, you know, I'm reading this book. I'm going through this path. I want to talk about, are we doing everything we could be doing in churn? Are we doing everything we could be doing in customer experience? Are we doing everything we could be doing in sales optimization? So for me, if it's just the fact that they're asking questions 
There's also going to be a questionnaire up online at tiffanybova.com that's going to have, here's the three or four questions you should ask per path so that maybe that's a way to start off, you know, your next staff call. And you know what, if we don't know who our customers are, how do we know what they want? If we don't know why they're churning, how do we fix it? If we don't, you know, if we don't have an idea of, you know, how they're using our products, how can we ever launch the next product? And so whatever the questions might be, I think it's super important that whomever reads the book socializes the things that might have stood out to them with those around them in their team so that it starts to get that mind shift change, right? Because growth IQ is about not just changing the way companies grow, but it has a lot to do with the mental model that companies need to have in order to respond to change more quickly. And you've got um, uh, really nice sketch notes in there. Can you hold up one of your, your, a copy of your book and show the, yeah. Yeah. Cause so let's see. It's you've got these. Yeah. And, and the ultimate goal of this was to um, try to bring it, bring the story more to um, feeling a lot lighter, if you will, on kind of what, you know, so it's a sketch note versus a big graph, you know, or a PowerPoint slide or an Excel image uh, to help people visually. I'm a visual learner. So I really like the idea of, um, you know, how can I bring things uh, to life, you know, about a particular story that, People can visually learn. So I'm a I'm a visual listen learner, not a read learner. So the other thing I did in here as well is if I were to have been reading the book, what I would have underlined, I actually underlined for you. Right. So that it's kind of this is what I thought was really the aha on this page or something I want you to just take a beat on, maybe read one more time, because sometimes people don't read the whole page. That if they had to just pick a couple of things, what do I want them to get out of it? Uh, I hope they get a lot more, but those were the key things. And so I wanted to make it feel a lot more approachable as a as a business book. And I think, you know, with those things, uh, as a reader, you get less fatigue because if other if it's all just words and words and words and words and words, you get to that I point agree. where you go, I've actually read two pages and I don't remember what it is that I've read. <laughs> and, I, and, 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 you know, and, and you can just get that fatigue sort of thing. Um, and I think that, yeah, that, and, that and, will and, really bring it out to, to, to people. And, and, um, and what you really want to do when people read your book is to be thinking at the same time, isn't it? It's not just a case of, I, I need to get through the 150 pages and then I can put it away and say that I've read it. Yeah, the, what I also did was I tried to make it in digestible bites. So each path has three case studies, two positive use cases of that particular path. And each one is about four or five pages. So you can you know whip through a case study. The third case study is when someone got that particular path wrong. And it worked against them. So you very quickly can see two who did it right, one who struggled uh, once they chose that particular growth path, why it wasn't right, and, and the lessons learned. So the path in and of itself is giving you three case studies. Uh, and I and I don't want us to lead the uh, lead your audience to think it's a full blown case study, you know, because there's no way you can do it in kind of five pages. Hmm. It's a point in time of when the company faced a crossroad and chose to pick this particular growth path as a as a way to course correct. Hmm. So I think that's helpful in also not feeling fatigue. We're like it's one concept through, you know, 300 pages. You're sort of like, what did I read? Yeah. It's fresh at each path. Uh, and if you could consume a path a week, uh, you know, or, or two paths a week, uh, it will be something that will really stick with you. And hopefully the stories will be things that will allow you to have better recall on what the key points were. T Tiffany, I could talk all day about this, but I'm, I've only got 30 minutes, really. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today and, and talking about your new book, Growth IQ. Um, and um, while you've been talking, I've decided I'm going to buy my copy from Amazon.com because I want the proper, uh, the, I want the blue copy rather than the uh, .co.uk one. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. It's been fantastic. Um, oh, well, thank you for having me, Tim. You've been a huge supporter of me over the years, and I and I greatly appreciate all your support. Well, I, you know, I, I support people that have, have got value to add. So, um, hey, Tiffany, it's, 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 it's easy. Um, remind people where they can get hold of you. Uh, so TiffanyBova.com is my site or at 
Tiffany underscore Bova on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and Pinterest. Thank you. And you can buy Growth IQ on Amazon, can't you? You can. You can buy it on the U.S. Amazon as well as U.K. and international uh, while they are two separate uh, covers. Uh, same book. OK, brilliant. Tiffany, thank you so much for today and good luck with your book. Oh, well, thank you so much. And thank you to all your listeners for uh, for spending some time with us today. You're welcome. Thanks, Tiffany. Bye. Bye bye.